Hi, this is Graham from Aphoristic Album Reviews, and today I'm talking about my choice for the 1000 second album, which is Emotion by Carly Rae Jepsen. Hi, I'm Jeff Steven, and you're listening to the 1000 Second Album Podcast. I spent 10 years going through the 1001 albums you must hear before you die, and now I'm asking people that are important to me all about the albums that are important to them. Enjoy! This is the Thousand Second Album Podcast. I'm Jeff Stephen, and I'm particularly excited for today's show because today uh, we have our first guest from New Zealand. Uh, He hosts fun weekly quizzes, puts together thought-provoking top 10 lists, and is an all-round engaging music writer. Please welcome Graham Faith. Good afternoon. It's afternoon here. Nice. <laughs> nice. And uh, the album of choice uh, today or this afternoon for you, this evening for me, is Carly Rae Jepsen's Emotion. And my first question would be, when did you first start listening to Carly Rae Jepsen? Well, I think like 99.9% of the world, like there's one Carly Rae Jepsen song that's obviously a lot more popular than you. <laughs> so Call Me Maybe. And like everyone else, pretty much I like would have just written her off as like a one-hit wonder. Although she had that song with Owl City as well, so she was kind of a um, two-hit wonder. But then I started to read about her um, 2016, 2015 album, Emotion. She kind of turned from a one-hit wonder into a critical darling. This is what, cause a really unusual career path. You know, normally, like, if you're a one-hit wonder, you kind of fade into obscurity. You don't have this, like, whole career where, where like, 99% of the world doesn't know about you. But there's this, like, dedicated, you have a dedicated fan base of music critics and aging music nerds. And I mean, she's a gay fan base as well. Got this very um, dedicated niche fan base now. But the way I um, basically heard it was I was sitting in the runway because I used to have to travel to the um, Southeast Asia for work a lot. And mm-hmm. um, I was on the runway in um, Australia, like listening to their in-flight music selection. And I decided to listen to, um, it wasn't actually Emotion itself, but there's a companion piece that came out a year later called Emotion Side B, which I'm basically considering as part of the album and um, talking about here as well, because it's all like all recorded at the same time. Like apparently she recorded 200 songs for this project. So I just listened to that and all, like I just put on the first track, which is called First Time. And um, I was just like completely hooked by the introduction. Like if you've heard it, it kind of starts with this like distorted snippet of the chorus before it just launches into the normal song. I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. And then ever since, you know, that one song turned me into a Carly Rae Jepsen fan, even though um, it probably wouldn't make my, okay, it doesn't because I've already made the list, but it wouldn't make my 10 favorite Carly Rae Jepsen songs or anything like that. But it was still enough to like make me into a fan. And I, I love those when, uh, like, because with the Thousand One Albums project, I found there were so many artists on there that I had initially dismissed as being one hit wonders. But once I started to listen to the albums, I was like, oh, this feels great to be wrong about this artist because there's so much beyond that initial hit that uh, even if the, the initial hit might have gotten the attention, there was so much uh, left to the catalog to explore as well. So that's always a fun thing where the the one or two hit wonder ends up being ever so much more. And the um, and this is from, uh, so you mentioned the, uh, the side B emotion was your gateway. And I think th- this one would be her third studio album, the discography, and then the side B attached to it. How does the this album compare to to the rest of her stuff? So it's kind of a dividing line for her in some ways. Like she has, like she almost started off. So her first two albums, like her first album, she basically almost started off as a folky. Like it's not quite folk music, but it kind of sounds like what I would call coffee house folk, where she's kind of got those kind of cheesy beats, you know, so you could play it in a cafe and it's kind of smooth and. But she's also like covering Joni Mitchell's both side now, both sides now, and she's covering John Denver's Sunshine on My Shoulders around that time. Yeah, and there's some okay songs on it, but it's not really like she hasn't really found her style. And obviously before that as well, she came out like the most the reason she first reached public attention was because she was a I'm sure you know this, but she was a contestant on Canadian Idol. So she came third or something off the top of my head. She said it was a good thing because if you come first or second or whatever, you get put into a record record deal, which is you know, you don't get that artistic freedom. You just kind of get locked into being made into a pop star in someone else's vision. And then her second album was kind of always, to me, feels like it was put together quickly. Follow up on um, Call Me Maybe, because Call Me Maybe was a big hit. Um, and that kind of came out of nowhere. It came out of an EP that she made. It's more like a pop album, like Emotion is, but it's just a lot less interesting sonically. Like, it doesn't have the same interesting production. Like, it's quite just feels like they're just pretty rushed together pretty quickly and like the um it's not as doesn't have as much individual personality and like the beats are kind of a little bit straightforward and you know just trying to rush something out but everything she's done since so she's made um two more 
proper albums since emotion so there's um dedicated in 2019 i think off the top of my head and then there was another one last year i mean both of those are good and both follow the emotion template to some you know they're more but emotions generally regarded as a best album it's certainly not a controversial opinion um most people would go with that nice and it's it's the only one i've heard so far of hers but she's she's one for one so far i was really i was really impressed like you said with the with the production there uh, and just the whole the whole package and it's interesting uh, you mentioned that the career trajectory doesn't usually go from you know one hit wonder pop star to critical darling and i like that idea of the the not winning the contest being a, a bit of a blessing in disguise as well it's interesting as well that it was so critically acclaimed because I know when we were growing up in the 90s, the idea of being a pop star wasn't really a, a compliment where people would have been striving to be perceived as a serious artist. And if you're a serious artist, you were in a band and you played alternative music and the mainstream was not something to be desired because it felt a bit manufactured or contrived in that way. But the times have changed. And in the 2010, so this was 2015, I think you said? Yeah, that's right. yeah, so 2015. So pop in the in the 2010s seems to be now where the where the singer songwriters are, and I understand on this one she did have a, a fair bit of creative control as well. Yeah, so um, there's an interesting question, like, is it like you, I would have largely dismissed pop music as disposable fluff in the 1990s, or you know, when I was you know I was a teenager right through the 1990s. Yeah, like obviously it wasn't taken this seriously most of the time. I would have like enjoyed some Britney Spears hits, but you know, I would never really thought of buying an album because you know, it just and it's kind of a combina it's it's hard to know what's the story. Like I should probably go back and listen to some of those nineties artists' pop albums to see, you know, if they're actually good or if they're just written off by the press. I don't know if it's a kind of a chicken and egg scenario where like as music gets taken more pop music's kind of get gotten taken more seriously by the press and by everyone like their quality has gone up because they've tried harder to make good albums so there's basically two schools of rock critic of popular music criticism so there's rockism which is kind of the traditional way of looking at rock music where you kind of value authenticity and people playing their own instruments and people writing their own songs and then there's poptimism which um, is a more recent movement which is kind of looking at pop music saying that you know like all all popular music is basically a disposable art form, so there's no reason to think, you know, that the more serious, more serious rock music with guitars is actually better. So, um, in some ways, yeah, like I'm still a product of rockism. I tend to look at pop music through rock, a rock lens. Sometimes something to be aware of as well, because I still feel like self-expression is quite an important thing, and like a lot of the pop artists I like still write their own material. For example, I was just like reading the other day about how Madonna is basically the um catalyst behind her songs that she writes because she's obviously a pretty big role model probably or probably like a trailblazer for all these like more recent generation of pop stars but also in the 1960s and even before that you have the Beatles who are like a self-contained band but then you also have like respected Pete you do have that division of duties where you have songwriters and producers off to one side and like a singer like Dusty Springfield or someone who doesn't really write their own material and that's because of the error it's from it's generally accepted by critics and by listeners as respectable. But somewhere in the 60s, that shift happened where um, you had to be a self-contained unit more, which isn't always a good thing because sometimes people have their strengths. It's also interesting because you had people like Carol King and Jimmy Webb who were like um, songwriters all through the 60s and then at the end of the 60s, um, or like Carol King tried before that, but they started recording their own albums and became yeah stars in their own rights. So it's quite a big tangent, but... Um, there's a um, website called Rate Your Music, which I'm sure you're probably familiar with. So they have a genre on there called dance pop. So the most popular dance pop album, of, the most acclaimed dance pop album on Rate Your Music is Michael Jackson's Thriller. But then after that, Carly Rae Jepsen's Emotions comes in in second. And a lot of the other entries are quite recent as well, like um, Jesse Weir's um, What's Your Pleasure and Magdalena's Magdalena Bay's Mercurial World. I think I got that name right. I could really like that album, but it kind of indicates that in the last few years, people are really listening to pop music more seriously. And yeah, yeah that's right. And it's funny, there's there's a part of me that really admires the idea that, like you said, the rockism, the do it yourself, where you're just like everyone's doing everything all by themselves. And they're, there's, I guess, that the word, I guess, is authenticity that people will throw around to praise it. But then the other, there's another part of me that thinks, 
the smartest musicians will also surround themselves by the the best possible people. And you mentioned with um, that dance pop category, how the number one rated album was Thriller. And of course, Michael Jackson was a phenomenal talent, but also knew that, well, you know, Quincy Jones is a pretty good producer. Yeah, you bring yeah. in Ed, Eddie Van Halen's played a guitar or two in his life and bring him in to do a solo. And again, just having that, the real talent on board as well, just makes a lot of sense if, if it's there. And speaking of the uh, the the thriller and just the idea of the uh, the eighties sound as well, I found with emotion there was there was a really fun eighties flavor to it, but it at the same time it didn't feel sort of retro or throwback because it's still like it had a, a modern feel to it, and the production really felt up to date as well. So I've read interviews where she like took a bit of a break after um, her second album, Kiss. I think she was in a musical or something like that, like she was on stage on Broadway or something. For a while but then she's trying to find the sound that she wanted and like the sound that she eventually came up with basically this 80s sound but with modern alternative production so and it's like if you look at the um credits for emotion there's basically a different production team on every track like it's her like listening to music and thinking oh i like that song who produced that and just getting in touch with them working on some songs with them so yeah it's interesting approach she was definitely the driving force behind that and just you know like grabbing the person from vampire weekend and that's neat that she she knew what she wanted and uh, worked with the people that provided those sounds and it definitely came through on the record and um speaking of uh like individual moments or individual uh, tracks are there particular ones that jump out of the playlist at you yeah so there's a lot of songs that, um there's a lot of i've got a long list of songs here so um, <laughs> so for favorite lyrics um before i forget that because i didn't write it down on my list one of my favorite lines is from um the song body language from ocean side B, where she says, I think we're overthinking it, which I thought was a great line. And the Kylie Jepsen is really interesting. Like, I, I mean, I couldn't find, I didn't really look for it when I was preparing for this, but there's a, there's a website that some filmmaker made about how basically she's not, like, none of her songs are really about being in a relationship. They're all about the sort of liminal spaces that are around the relationship. Like, she's, sort of, it's about lust or about unrequited love or about trying to sort things out after a breakup and stuff like that. There's nothing really about being in a relationship. <laughs> so the one, so one song on my list was actually, um, that's not about relationships because basically everything else is, um, is LA hallucinations, which is, um, would have been actually a really good single in some way, because I think she probably wanted to, um, I don't know, like, I don't know if any single would have worked for her in some ways. Cause I think she got saturated, you know, she just got that saturation with call me maybe. And, um, didn't really have any other hits from that album and like no matter what she would have released it might have bombed anyway but I think that like that song might have worked because it's just edgier and way different in the production's edgier and she talks about like the first lines like I remember being naked and the, the um choruses like Buzzfeed Buzzards and TMZ Crows yeah like that would have been a good single just to like like it's nowhere near my favorite song on the album but it's the most different kind of establishes her as a you know she kind of has this girl next door I can't believe she's actually in her late 20s but she's doing this like pop, bubblegum pop song image um so that would have helped that might have helped her yeah so those are some of my favorite lyrics and then some of my favorite songs i think a lot of people's favorite carly ray jepson song was the first song which on um, emotion which is um run away with me which has that big iconic kind of synth saxophone lead so it's kind of got that big widescreen kind of you know like i feel like one day it'll get used in a romantic movie and it'll just become this massive standard because it hasn't yeah like it still hasn't you know it's just a song that people who are carly ray jepson fans know really because what Carly Rae Jepsen does a lot is have this big euphoric lift and that's what she kind of does. It's almost like a calling card that she does better than anyone else. So you'll get this big, big chorus. It's just um, lifts and lifts and get this big sugar rush adrenaline hit. Yeah, so that's in that song. And then um, another song from the first side that I really enjoy is called All That. So mainly about that, like it's kind of this like smooth kind of groove with a slap bass and she's like, um, the thing I, I just really, really like the middle way from that song. Like sometimes I just listen to that song just to hear so I like that one. There's some really good bass playing on the album, like even though it's kind of a synth pop album, you know, they've got like some real bass players in there who are just amazing. Like they, they're saying the, how the producer laid down some bass lines, but then they've got this actual like crazy pro guy to do. So there's a couple of really notable bass lines. So Boy Problems is another favorite. So it's got the really funky kind of disco crazy bass line that's um, driving it. Plus When I Needed You, which is the last um, track on the official album. Um, it's also got this huge bass line and it's an interesting song because it's got quite a different tone than the rest of the album like the rest of the album's kind of like um a bit wistful and a bit about longing but this one's just this kind of like not really nasty because it's Kylie Rae Jepsen but a bit of a kiss off where she's like um 
yeah, we were you when I needed you. And she kind of, um, you know, just, just a little, got a little bit of bite to it, which is a little bit unusual for her, but there's like, and it's, there's a really um cool sort of, like, it's not even really a bridge, but sort of just go, drops right back after the second chorus and just drops down to bass and vocals and builds back up into this big machine again. I'm saying it's on the most, and those are some of my favorites. Did you have any favorites? The yes, for sure. And it's I'm I'm pleased you mentioned the uh, that sax lead in uh, "Run Away with Me" because I'm I'm a huge believer in intro hooks. And as soon as that saxophone kicked in, I was like, "Okay, Carly, you've got my undivided attention." And it's just what a way to open it too, where it sort of sets the tone right off the bat. And the um, and yeah, boy, boy problems was another one that jumped out at me. Just the the production kind of reminded me of Daft Punk's Get Lucky. Like just that there was a real slickness to it, but in, in the best possible way. And so, yeah, but it was, it was one of those ones where I, I didn't find any, any misses in the bunch either. Just it was, and I liked how you brought up the idea of the LA hallucinations too, because I think you're right after the, uh, the extreme airplay of Call Me Maybe, any single would have been a relative you know drop in in sales i'd imagine because like that was just that was everywhere it was inescapable but having that one maybe would have been an interesting contrast with the uh with the the, the predecessor there but overall i uh, really neat stuff and amazing that there was so much good material left over for that side b as well that uh did you say 200 songs were were written for the, in the yeah project? something like that i think so yeah. for um dedicated next album as well it's kind of crazy yeah. <laughs> and i liked and i i liked that she did take her time because i think it was kiss somewhere in the ballpark of 2012 or so yeah so it's neat that yeah that i like that they didn't just rush into production because you mentioned with kiss it sounded almost a bit uh hastily arranged that they wanted to capitalize on the success of the big single but here it does seem like they really took their time to to get it right to get the sound to get the the crew they wanted and to just make the album she wanted to make which is uh yeah which is refreshing that it wasn't just Okay, we gotta capitalize while uh, while things are hot, <laughs> but they they took the time to do the right album, which is which is awesome. <laughs> um, and also, what did you think about? Um, I really like you because that was the first single. Um, it's quite an interesting one. I wrote on that one. Uh, I always scroll down little notes, and the the chorus sound I thought was just huge. You mentioned the idea of the. Uh, like that that's one of her signatures where there's that euphoric lift or just the big chorus and the i just thought yeah there's the sound was enormous there in that one which yeah as a single i guess it makes sense to have the uh that sort of big hit there yeah because that's it's weird because it kind of maybe it was a little bit close to call me maybe as well because there's parts of that song i really like but i rule mm -hmm. it one of my least lesser favorites on the album like um yeah because i think that there's like an amazing bridge again that kind of lifts and you yeah, know yeah. she's pretty, those middle weights there's a kind of really nice moments in the verse melody as well, but yeah, like it's a little bit down the list. Like I wonder what would happen if she'd release one run away with me or LA hallucinations or something like it's all, or it just might've been the lost cause. Yeah. I'd be there. I think there's like some amazing checks on side B as well. Um, so I have an eight year old, I have two daughters, but my younger daughter is eight. And so she really likes, uh, she's probably had a bit of Carly Rae Jepsen exposure, but the three songs she's really connected to. So one of them is not surprisingly call me maybe. Yeah. But yeah. So both on um, side B. So I don't know if your your girls are into um, the movie Ballerina as well. Like it's on Netflix here, so they've seen it a couple of times. It's, um, the song cuts the feeling, which is kind of like was added to later editions of Emotion Side B. So it's like an outtake from the Outtakes album or something. But it's, um, yes. it's like it's one of her best big euphoric choruses again. And it's almost like a sort of a um, statement of purpose when she says, "I want to cut to the feeling," because that's kind of what her songs do, you know, straight to the big emotional moment and don't. Yeah. You know, don't muck around too much. My younger daughter likes is called Store, which is um this really interesting um song. Like it's um almost feels like she just had these three different bits of song. This like I don't know what to do with these, so I'll just stick them together. Like I don't know if you can remember that one, but it's just got this bits of the song have no relation to each other at all. It kind of starts off as this delicate breakup song, and the chorus is just like I'm just going to the store to the store. It's just but really it, weird. But it works as a package. <laughs> yeah, but it kind of barely like you can kind of see the. Sellotape, like it, I can't <laughs> like. It. And then on emotion side B as well, like Fever's another, like one of my top, one of her top draw songs, I think. Like, um, it's a kind of liminal space again between where she's just got out of a relationship or something, but still obsessing about it. And um, yeah, it's just got that big. Um, I stole, I stole your bike, and it's got that. I think yeah, sorry, is it where I rode my bike? Something, but it's got that line, and yes, yeah, it's what she kind of does. It's, it's another really good um example of what she does. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's fun. I don't know. My girls, they, uh, did you folks ever play the video game Just Dance, where you're sort of trying to mimic the moves that the people are doing on screen? <laughs> Yeah, we don't have it here, but we played it at someone else's house. Oh, it is, yeah. So they, uh, in the, the version we have, the Call Me Maybe is one of the dances. So I think they'd probably single that out as their favorite and probably still remember some of the choreography from it too. So. <laughs> but yeah. uh, that's fine. But, they, uh, but maybe they, some of those highlights, so Stone or Cut to the Feeling, those may uh, enter the rotation then as well. I like that. <laughs> nice. I guess, and I, I love these as the answer too, because it's sort of like an asterisk where the thousand second album can sort of be both uh emotion and emotion side b as well because it's it's the same uh, it still counts <laughs> but overall why would you say uh emotion belongs as the thousand second album oh as you know i like sending you a list of suggestions that um i can talk about um so there's a few <laughs> it's interesting because it might actually be the weakest of the five in some ways like i can make this feel like i can make this amazing playlist if i just took my favorites from emotion and emotion side b not like there's anything that weak on emotion, but there's just some like totally killer songs on emotion side B that, you know, you could make kind of hybridize or make this a, you know, really strong album, like all conquering pop album of the, mm -hmm. that decade, you know. In some ways it's the least accomplished album on that list that I sent you, but it's also like the one I might have the strongest emotional connection to just because you just get this emotion, you know, get this adrenaline rush from it. Or I do anyway, where like it's, um you know, big and bold and emotional, I guess, yeah. which is getting here it's a good title for the album yeah obviously. it's it's apt <laughs> yeah and as i was listening for all the songs from emotion and emotion side b this morning and like there's a few um because the way we listen to music now obviously on spotify playlists so there's like about 10 or 12 songs that i you know return to quite often but there's a few songs that you know just can't even sort of vaguely remember how that song goes um especially the like the bonus tracks on the original emotion album like i um kind of even forgotten what they're because i'm listening to lots of other music so i can't remember how some of those songs go but there's about 10 songs, 10 songs on the emotion and emotion side B package that I just like, just think are amazing. Like I use body language as my um, wake up tone in the, um, um, on my phone in the morning yeah. sometimes. I, I quite like that. Um, I think I'm in trouble kind of learning just to wake yeah. <laughs> Carla Gibson just has this big, you know, emotional, big um, adrenaline rush, you know, it's what she yeah. does. So kind of good wake up music if you can handle it. <laughs> for sure <laughs> i like that and i think for me though those are the albums i'd call the must hear ones too where it's not necessarily the ones that are you know somehow verifiably note for note the best albums but they're the ones that are the most meaningful in some way or the ones that you, ha you have to hear because they have that impact and so for me i'll take a an impactful album over a you know, statistically verifiably great album any day. And so I, I like that as the choice for that reason. Yeah. And it's like a gateway to pop. I mean, for me, yeah, like I was just kind of would have largely rejected pop music for that. But I think like, as we've been talking about, like it was kind of a pretty good, like the last dec decade or so has been a pretty good decade for pop music. There's other artists who are kind of like that doing more, you know, like making more personal pop music. It's an interesting time to be a pop music fan, I think, more than for like rock music in a lot of ways. Sorry, rock fans, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, and that's and it's perfect for me too because, like, I spent the that decade going through that thousand one book, and it cut off in two thousand five. So I'm relatively oblivious to what's been happening for the last eighteen years. So this is fantastic too because now this gives me a glimpse as to some mid twenty tens, and if this is what the the decade sounds like, then I think I'm in for a treat discovering uh, some of the rest of the music from that era too. We also have just this general phenomenon which is like kind of the dissolution of the monoculture like you know like in the 60s there was a pretty big correlation between what was popular and what was good like everyone like the Beatles and you kind of get this fringe cage like the um, Velvet Underground who were you know acclaimed in retrospect but not popular at the time but most of the time there's a correlation but now just like and then it kind of split and you have like the Bay City Rollers and on one end and like maybe like television on the other end you know the um, popular but not critically acclaimed in the critically acclaimed but not popular but now it's just this like kind of free-for-all where there's all sorts of people like it's really easy to make music but hard to get people to hear your music because there's so much music going on but there's plenty of good music in other places too it's certainly not a pop monopoly like um like big thief because i've been keeping a um, list on my side of like my favorite album for e from each year mm -hmm. and last year became only this first album first artist ever to um had my favorite album for two years like it's been completely you know not even me engineering it but it's just been you know like every other year like it's been a different artist but it's a 
just an environment where you can it's just hard to fight there's just so much music and it's like not as culturally significant as it was in early decades like you can't really argue that anyone has the um the same cultural cachet as you know like the who kind of pioneered rock music did like the Beatles or Bob Dylan or you know like and it makes it harder to you know it's a kind of this belief where you like Woodstock or whatever or Crosby, Stills and Nash and Young's Ohio you know this music's changing the world and like having an impact or but it's you know it's just it's just the kind of entertainment medium that's kind of being you know usurped by in some ways by streaming and by some as like reading how advertising is really the last um remaining bastion of the monoculture because everyone sees advertising but everything else is like split into little streaming buckets and yeah you can be listening to completely you know you think this is music's amazing but like 99% of the rest of the world won't know about it so yeah right. And I wonder if that's part of the appeal here too, is that you mentioned it wasn't a huge hit at the time. So maybe that's part of the appeal too with emotion is that it's it wasn't necessarily the, the humongous commercial success she might've had previously, but those who got it, maybe that feels like you're in the club, like this is our album, we get it. And uh, and we like it. As yeah, well. she's certainly like the underdog that you can yeah. support. You know, she's like this massive one hit wonder. Because she's kind of saying that she made so much money from Call Me Maybe, she's just kind of set up for life and can just do whatever, you know, can make the music she wants, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. and that, that's a good problem to have, to have that artistic <laughs> freedom to, <laughs> to yeah. do so. I like it. Excellent. Well, uh, a huge thank you for coming today, Graham. And, uh, and I guess until the next time when we chat about one of the other ones from that list as well. <laughs> sure, thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Take care. This has been the Thousand Second Album Podcast. Thanks for sharing some of your time, energy, and attention with us today. Take care.